Welcome to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast for authentic dating in Denver. My name is Dave Glazer, your host and facilitator, where each week we bring expert guests to come share their knowledge, tools, and tips so that we can show up as our most authentic self. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast. I am so ecstatic to introduce my expert guest today, Mr. Stuart Matola. How are you, sir? Doing good. Good, thank you so, thank you so much for joining me at the studio office because I've found over the last year of interviewing podcast guests that an in-person interview and conversation is so much more authentic than when we do Zoom or just a phone call. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Your office. Um, we met at the Radical Love Summit, which was just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you were a speaker there and I just had to learn more about you because um, I, I found out that you wrote a book. I love the title. So. Fixing you is killing me. Is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that was my story, and that's one of many stories. I noticed that you're a really good storyteller through the blogs. Um, really, really enjoyed reading some of the blogs. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to learn more about who you are, but specifically why and how you got into this business of relationship coaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it probably goes back to when I was five and I noticed my relationship with my brother was not so great. He was older and, uh, you know, demanding and, uh, yeah, physically confrontational, I'd say. And then over the years, over time, I think just a fascination with psychology, human dynamics, interdynamics. And the interesting thing is I was never, um, I had considered, I did study psychology somewhat on the university level, but, uh, I found the clinical version, um, not as interesting to me. And uh, over the years, um, you know, in my own personal journey, over 20 years of marriage, parenting a son, um, in my 20s I was heavy into Lakota ceremony. So I was always seeking the spiritual, the psychological. And um, I was always a writer as well. So writing was a great way for me to explore uh, what was happening within me and what I could bring to the world as a, as a gift of my own experience, my own observations of other people. And uh, through the course of a 20 year marriage, um, you know, really always committed to working on relationship and just always knowing that uh, relationship is the key to happiness. Of course, like we're social beings. Yeah. And as a human, we crave it. Yeah, and as we know in our culture, we, we we're, we're sold the myth that uh, material wealth is going to trump that. And uh, we really, you know, ideally have both. And, and, and we don't even need near as much wealth as, the, you know, is purported out there, enough to sustain ourselves, take care of our needs, and a little bit more, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm fascinated by the fact that that, thing, that one piece relationship that is such the key to happiness is something we get no education about. You know, we learn nothing about it in high school, nothing about it in college, and we're living in a time where people like myself or others studying this field, you know, I should be teaching a course in high school or, or college, um, that critical key component of wellness and well-being. And so, you know, in our culture, we have to figure it out, figure it out ourselves, and often that requires, you know, a lot of heartache. Mm -hmm. um, Trial and error. Yeah. A lot of mistakes along the way. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So we, we learn that by example. Our families give us um, the yeah. example of how to relate to each other. Yeah. Like you were mentioning with your bully of a brother. Yeah. Well, I don't call him that, you know. He'll never <laughs> listen to this, but that's all the cool. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a good way today, I'm, I'm proud to say. Um, but no, I mean, often our family systems have poor relational uh, templates. And so it's not until I think often past 30, 35 that we start to look at the fact that, oh, there's a relational template that was handed to me from my childhood that I'm actually recreating or um, enacting mm -hmm. in a relationship with a partner. And so in a lot of my work, you know, I'm often just gonna say to someone like, oh, you're upset or this is happening. You know, you reacted this way. How old were you? You know, or, or how old were you? With, uh, how old are you in the place that you're reacting from? 
you know, so somebody might, you know, get it after we've done a little bit of work and, oh, that was my 12 year old leading me or my five year old. Um, I'm a real big fan of uh, Terry Reel's work, who's an author and psychotherapist, um, you know, who will often, you know, as well look at, you know, how old were you when you were reacting in that way? And so it's typically not till we're a little bit older that we can understand that uh, we have old relational templates, you know, whether it's an inner child um, or something that is leading us and how do we get into our adult self and often that takes time to make a bunch of mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that in, in my own life of like, um, an example would be somebody with a history of trauma, they kind of get stuck at that age at which the trauma occurred. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard to, to grow up into an adult without reliving that age time after time after yeah. time. So to personalize it, I'll say my story was I was a pleaser. Um, I was a really sweet boy, you know, sensitive being, um, very competitive on the soccer field. That was one place where my ferocity came out, but generally in my relationships. And uh, um, when I came into my marriage, I had a lot of pleaser, a lot of fixer, a lot of rescuer. I think some of it's from the cultural mythology too, that as men we're supposed to uh, make our woman happy. I often refer to the uh, slogan, happy wife, happy life. And often that's said by men today um, in the context of, you know, if I just take care of this, then she'll be happy. You know, it's not authentic. And, and, and they're, men are not taught that it's okay to have needs. And, you know, we're moving past that in this day and age. So for me personally, I really, um, I wasn't willing to acknowledge I had needs. I didn't self-advocate for my needs. And my wife had a lot of chronic illness, um, you know, IBS, um, uh, she had gallbladder disease, she had had a West Nile virus, just a host of things that were really demanding for our relationship, on our marriage. Um, I was 30 when my son was born, he's 20 today. Um, and so raising my son in an environment where I was trying to be the hero, hold the family up, hold the family system together. And, you know, we had many happy years for sure. And we had a great family dynamic in many ways, but underneath the surface was me getting burnt out and, uh, getting to a point where I was paying the cost of not acknowledging my own needs, mm -hmm. my own emotional needs, um, my own relational needs. Um, and that's a, you know, that can be a place of victim consciousness, you know? And uh, so over time, especially through uh, work that I did with the Men's Leadership Alliance based out of Boulder, Colorado, since I was 33, so it's been 17 years. And then within seven or eight years, I was facilitating circles and leading retreats with men. Um, so a lot of my background came from doing developmental work, specifically around rediscovering a masculinity that I did not have a, a template for and um, that had to do with self-advocacy. Um, you know, we hear a lot in the coaching world, speak your truth, but it's so important that we're doing that in a way that's um, kind and loving with the ones that we love and care about because some people, you know, they kind of get shotgunned out of the whole speak your truth movement and they're speaking their truth to everybody and this is my truth and it's not even necessarily angry or aggressive per se, but it's so full of this new force that somebody's being excited about without understanding, you know, the difference between intention and impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, over time I, I uh, you know, got clear that uh, my marriage was not working and I think what the real hero's journey for me in that path was, which my book speaks about, is that um, I still love this woman greatly. I still would have, you know, thrown myself in front of a train for her, probably. And I ironically had been doing that for years. And Metaphorically speaking. Yeah, and, and so I experienced the cost. I mean, in our family system, I was working more, I was holding down, you know, um, a lot of the dinner prep, the laundry, the, the domestic. Um, and, you know, she was a contributor as well, but I was trying to be Superman. And part of that was also that masculine, you know, I got to keep the family together, take mm -hmm. care of things, be the provider. Um, and, and honestly, a huge part of it came from the wound of my own father being invisible. And so while it was important for me to keep the family system intact, 
um, being there as a father for my son was so important. So I'd pick him up from school three to four days a week, um, you know, and I was a very, I mean, even when he was one years old, I was getting out of bed to go grab him to hand him to my wife so she could nurse him, you know, I mean, when he was a baby. Mm -hmm. So it was always about being involved and I, I think, you know, I burned out and I did also have to acknowledge that this was my doing. This was my making. I made this situation. And as much as I might have projected or blamed, I had to own it. And if I didn't own it, I wasn't gonna turn it into gold. Um, so my book, Fixing You Is Killing Me, which by the way, my former wife did approve the title. She had read the book as well. <laughs> and uh, you know, today we're on good terms, we're allies. Um, obviously our relationship has changed significantly. Um, but it was my hero's journey for sure. And I continue to have hero's journeys. I think that's what happened. You step into one and uh, uh, you know, if you pass through it efficiently, and I always say with allies and mentors, and that's actually straight out of Joseph Campbell's work. You know, he talks about going through the dark forest and the hero's journey is often referenced um, in our culture, obviously in films like Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, etc. But we, this, this process does happen to us as humans as we age, as we grow older. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we either navigate it and grow, or um, often we don't and we stay in fear. You know? Yeah, we're, we're creating this story of the hero. And then also at the same time, I heard the word victim in there too. Like, and taking on all this role and responsibility um, to kind of play the victim role eventually. Yeah. And yeah. And that's where burnout can come from, and that's where um, just like being tired all the time, yeah. you know. So I have a I have a quick question for you. Sure. Why are we taught as boys that emotions are for sissies? Well, uh, in, in the psychology of masculinity, they call that the the man box. So first, I want to elaborate a little bit about it, and then I'll try to transition into the why. Because I don't know if I have an immediate answer to the why, but it's very, actually, it's very it feels actually, like, actually I do. Yeah. So just real quick, and this is often taught in men's work. We have if we just narrow it to four emotions: joy, sadness, fear, and anger. There's more emotions, but anger we're allowed, right? Because we can be tough, we yeah, can be macho, masculine. we can yeah. kick ass. Uh, fear, sissy. You know what are you afraid of? Yeah. Um, sadness again, similar recourse. And then joy, like giddy joy, might be considered gay for you know boys, you know between the ages of five or twelve or whatever. So we call from, it the from their box. peers or yeah, from their yeah. peers for sure. And so um, you know, so you think of a, a a man who was who was a boy and you know was allowed one out of four emotions. So that's why they call it the man box. It's it's you know I know it's not a PC term, but it's it's a form of emotional retardation. And so women today, you know, in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are dating are wondering why are men so unable to handle much emotionally or have hard conversations or express themselves in a constructive way instead of having temper tantrums or blowing up, et cetera, et cetera. Or well, withdrawing or completely. shutting down. And so it starts there. And I think, um, you know, obviously it's American mythos, American mythology of invulnerability. I think at core... Um, you know, as much as we love to praise the ideals of America, free enterprise, opportunity, etc., there's a shadow side, you know, and it's about domination. It's about uh, invulnerability. It's about dominating the globe and the world order and uh, dominating your emotional system, you know. Yeah, and, an invincibility of sorts. Yeah, and so there's been a confusion <clears throat> that uh, shutting down emotions is, is the key to invincibility. I think there are moments for sure. Um, as we know, uh, you know, between the macho jerk and the new age wimp, uh, you know, the new age wimp needs to have a little bit more of that, a little bit more of that, you know, yeah. show the F yeah. up and, yeah. you know, <laughs> okay. just suck it up and deal. Um, and they also need a lot of tender loving kindness. So, you know, uh, I, I think anyone who's ever been to therapy, like inner child work is all the rage, you know, but often in that work it's like love the child love yourself love 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 but yet you also need to let the child know listen you're not in charge you're just a child you know i am the adult here and that would be in a parenting situation as well 
but also if somebody was doing inner work within themselves, um, you know, there, there has to be a way in which we step up and command our lives and command those parts of us that if they run us, it ain't going to go so well. That's, that's, easy, uh, that's part of the process of like personal responsibility. Like kind of facing what we've experienced in our lives, putting behind ourselves this victim mentality and taking complete ownership of, of our choices, our decisions, and where we're at now. Yeah, but we can do it on two levels. One is more superficial, and it's effective for many people. Um, and it's more conceptual, it's more teaching oriented. And the other is just a deep dive into your own woundedness, mm -hmm. grief, yeah. shadow. Peeled back the layers of the onion. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a harder journey, mm -hmm. but it's one that sticks longer. And it's one that uh, creates a stronger foundation for the individual. And it also requires really skilled guidance. Because you can't do that alone, you know. Whether it's a therapist, a coach, an elder, mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people are trying to do it today in ayahuasca ceremonies, or you know, in in you know, ten day vision fast ceremonies. And I don't really like to, in any way, um, prescribe or not or unprescribe a certain modality, but integration is the key. You can go through those journeys, but without sustained integration. Like you're gonna be working on this for the rest of your life, and it's gonna get easier, and it's gonna get better, but it's not just gonna happen during In a ceremony. Days, no, of course, yeah. um, and how do you integrate it? How do you show up every day? Do you have a daily practice? Do you have a, you know, meditation? Uh, do you have a way of of you know consistently coaching yourself? And you know, you talked a little bit prior before we got on air about the Enneagram and how that's been a roadmap, and and so that's. Uh, uh, that sense of a roadmap and you know mm -hmm. how am I defining my path and is it aligned with my values and really what I work with people on in relationship is how each individual can be in their sovereignty and by that I mean um, living in integrity with your authentic desire desires needs and integrity I'll say that again living in integrity with your authentic desires needs and identity those are very complex things to fully understand your desires, your needs, and your identity, and your authentic ones. Um, and that takes a lot of time to discover as adults, because that's what growing up's all about. Yeah, that is that is the true, um, the true path along the journey. Um, is is when we lose our identity. Mm. How do we come back to it? And that's what you're talking about with the sovereignty is reconnecting with that identity in your most, uh, most authentic and integrous. And now as you're saying it, um, I think that's part of why we do need to often take the, the, the journey to the underworld mm -hmm. when we don't know who we are and we're lost in the dark forest yep. because it's not until you're lost that you can be found. That's right. And you, you might need some assistance along the way. Like, oh, yeah. uh, you said elder, a, a mentor, mentor a coach. an ally. Uh, for me, it was cognitive behavior therapy. Like, nice. I sought out a counselor because I needed, a, I needed a professional for a while. Absolutely. And for me, I had, you know, when I turned 30 and my son was born, I was a teacher in a public schools. I was freaked out, financial responsibility. Like, oh my God. How am I going to deal with this? I can barely provide for myself. Here comes another being. I was trying to teach kids in a classroom. Now I got a kid full time. I'm not sleeping. And I, you know, went into therapy for seven years. Uh, I was working with an international trainer of a certain modality. Uh, so this guy was like top of, in his field. Um, so, you know, that was seven years of that. When I was leaving my marriage, I had a very fierce coach who was uh, executive director of a very prestigious men's organization na nationwide, um, the Mankind Project, which you mm -hmm. may have heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just met the right people at the right time, but that also takes looking for it, you know? You know yeah, being open yeah, to being definitely. helped, and especially for men, the challenge is to be open to be helped. Because That's part of our mythos about, as well as emotional invincibility is, I got this. Yeah, I can do it all on my own. Exactly. I'm, ex I'm acceptable when I'm on my island by myself. And, and but what I like to say to men is a true king has a court that serves him, you know, has advisors. So f 
for, for, for men who want to think of it that way, you get a team, you mm-hmm. know, if you choose that path. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, nothing happens alone in this life. We know that now. Uh, let's just say that a man or a woman is getting in their own way and you have this um, ideology of unconscious self-betrayal. Mm. Are they fooling themselves unconsciously? Is that what that mm. means? I think self-betrayal is taught in the culture. It's taught from the age you're five and you see that first Disney film and you, and you hear the words, I would die for you. <laughs> it's pretty idealistic, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's like I always say to people, "What good am I dead to her?" <laughs> you know. Fair. But just that. I mean, do you, do you see what I'm saying? I do. Like it's grandiose. It's like that's it's, the ultimate self-sacrifice. It sells a lot of movies. Sure does. It sells a lot of music. Uh, it's big business. Yeah. Um, but mature love would be boring on the screen. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it just that's, why it's, that's why nobody puts it on TV is because nobody would watch it. Yeah. <laughs> there might be some. Some TV. I don't watch a lot of TV, but there's some TV where I've seen adult relationships sure. navigated with some maturity. Like even Family Matters had Steve Urkel. Uh, yeah, I don't even know that one. <laughs> but like This Is Us, I'm not like a huge fan of the show, but I've watched some. Yeah. And I think, you know, they're trying to really handle adult relationships. And yet the characters are often really immature. Yeah, they're, uh, they're big personalities so that it actually... Um, gravitates or yeah or draws people in some are but so going back to that concept of unconscious self-betrayal that was my journey uh in the sense that i wasn't even aware how much i was sh- well i had a sense yeah I, you know being the man i really thought if my wife could get healthy my family would live happily mm-hmm. ever after if this then when yeah. yeah and and uh you know it reached a point where um, I got clear and I had to say to her, um, if you can't see the light in you, my seeing the light in you is not going to help you. You know, you have to see it in yourself. Mm-hmm. And I didn't feel like she was, you know. And interestingly enough, um, while our divorce was, you know, hard on both of us, it was super hard for me. I left the woman I loved. I was still in love. I was I had deep grief sessions, you know, and I have a passage in my book about that. Um, but I had to keep stepping in, and I had this coach who kept, you know, one thing that he said, and it wasn't just her. I was fearful of breaking up the family system for my son. Um, but it got clear that I was not being of any value to my son being a small me, going around following his mommy's orders and taking care of this, taking care of that. and. Um, you know, to be fair, it wasn't her just ordering me around, but there was a subconscious thread of that where I was really trying to take care of a lot. And I want to be clear, like, I wasn't, I wasn't Superman. I snapped. I got irritable, you know. Um, and I would go on these weekend journeys to men's retreats. And honestly, I had a lot of my emotional intimacy needs met during the last 10 years of my marriage through men's groups, meeting with men every two weeks, talking about our challenges, getting support, you know, and that's a powerful thing in terms of that team of support and that court of support. You know, you can be a king in that environment. And, 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 you know, if you're in a good men's group or a woman's group, those people are there to serve you. And that's a powerful thing. Um, And I'm clear that I'm going on all kinds of different tangents here. And so just coming back to how I was betraying myself in, in my marriage, and it sounds like a cliche, and it's much more profound than that, but I was not being my most powerful me. Mm-hmm. I, I was being a small version of myself who was uh, afraid of inflicting the same hurt on my wife, and maybe even my son as well, that I felt as a child. Meaning, I lived in a suburban home. I was on my own a lot. There was, you know, neglect just in terms of the lack of presence of other family members. And then, you know, a brother who was physically, you know, dominant. Um, So, 
my shadow was running me. So I often talk about big love versus small love. Small love is shadow, and by shadow I mean a part of you that you repress or hide, a fear, uh, an old childhood wound. Um, that's, that's small love. And, and I honestly think most marriages today are in small love. I'm with you really because I'm afraid of um, being alone. I'm afraid of my financial assets being diminished. Um, I'm afraid of not having as much material wealth as we live in together, even as a couple, even though my life force is dead with you, mm -hmm. um, versus a big love. And just back to the small love, that's the kind of love that says, um, either you will complete me, fulfill me as Disney World is, um, or says, I will tolerate you, versus the big love says, I choose you because in you, I see um, somebody who inspires me, who challenges me, who's kind to me, who makes my life bigger. Who, I, I, I don't, I'm not with you because without you, I'm not going to be okay. I'm with you because with you, I'm amazing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I'm just starting to explore a relationship right now that completely is in line where I see a sovereign self in her and a sovereign self in me. In two months, we've had the most mature conversations. We've already navigated some difficult challenges. And do I know, do I, is, is the barometer, do we last forever? No, not at all. You know, our relational path will have a journey. It could be six months, it could be a year, it could be two years. But I've met somebody who um, can handle themselves at a level of maturity, honesty and kindness and, and non-reactivity. That means when, when something triggers us, we often say, you know what, I need to take a day on this. I need to get clear with myself. So that's kind of like going back to the inner oracle. And that's one of the things I coach the most on. Like, when you don't know, allow yourself to be with not knowing. Take in the doubt, take in the hope, stir it in the pot, see what keeps showing up for a day or two, or see what your fears are. And be patient with yourself because sometimes, and this is what my blog's about on Sunday, how we're complex human beings and how we confuse. We want, we want consistency in relationship, but often what we're really asking for is linearity. Consistency can hold variation and distinction and difference and most of all contradiction, you know? So I write about like, am I crazy? I want to be in a relationship, but I fear her. Or I want to be in a relationship with someone, but I'm afraid of giving up my freedom. You can hold both when you get bigger. And then a lot of times in my marriage, for a good year I held, I'm done and I love her. Mm -hmm. And in my book I write a passage like, I actually tracked it for like 60 days. Oh, it's 90-10 today, it's 80-20, it's 70-30. Oh, it flipped, it's 30-70, you know? And I just sat with that for a while. And obviously in a big decision like divorce or separation, you know, sitting with it for a month or two, is appropriate. Oh, absolutely. And and when it comes down to it, um, how do you help yourself or people decide to stay or leave? Through that process. I also talk about something called the fine thin path, which is a way that you can actually hold two opposing perspectives that are both true and authentic for yourself. So in my case, it was I'm done and I love her, which felt so opposite of each other. Well, if you're done, how can you love her? How can you love her and be done, you know? And so that, that fine, thin path, that middle way, allowed me not to swing to one polarity or the other, to hold both, to know both were true, and then dial in that carburetor mix of, what is it, fuel and water, or fuel and air, yeah. to know which Different was muscles. true. Like, hey, it's, 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 oh, it's becoming clear, 90, 10, I'm done. Yeah, and we don't necessarily have to be in a relationship with somebody to love them. You said so yourself that you still love this woman and you're, you're not married to her anymore. Yeah. And one thing I want to be clear is that while this book is geared towards relationship, um, a lot of people have read it and said uh, it's actually really helped me a lot with big career decisions. Um, it's basically any crossroads, you know. Uh, I'm done with the job. But man, I got the sweet financial deal. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you sit with that for two or three months? And make big decisions like that as well. Right, of course.
Yeah. Um, so, again, the fine, thin path and all of this is a deepening into a sovereignty, into self-honoring, which is the opposite of self-betrayal. So when you're running your life from a sovereign place, in integrity with your authentic desires, needs, and identity, you become a king or a queen. But you have to keep working at it. And a king, a good king, will work tirelessly for his kingdom, as will a good queen, because they understand that there's no end to this growth, joy, sadness. It's all on the table for the rest of your life. But how do you interact with it mm -hmm. in a way that uh, it makes you bigger and you're connected to the glory of spirit, God, Tonkashila, Ganesh, whatever you, you know, track or whatever inspires you, earth, mm -hmm. wind. So to me, unconscious self-betrayal, which I speak a lot to in the book, is a teacher, ultimately. Just if, like If you're aware of it and if you're tapping into it. Because if yeah. you're going to choose to ignore it and choose not to face it, that's not a help at all. Yeah. Because you're simply just stuffing it down and isolating yourself and numbing it in your own strategic ways. Yeah. But just helping somebody understand that it has the potential to be a teacher usually sets off yeah. it's one of those contradictions again you know and when we can reconcile those contradictions like we can be consistent mm -hmm. and not feel trapped in a linearity that feels what's linear going to an office every day with a job you hate you know um, it's more of like a flatter line yeah, it's, like flat <laughs> it's still line it's still linear but it's like the least quick progression. Uh, you mean consistency? Yeah, you were. It takes time. It visualizing takes time. just like punching the clock every day. Mm -hmm. It's so flat as far as the line. It might increase over forty years to be this much higher than when it started, or this hockey stick bell curve mm. of just exponential growth, which yeah. is something that I've experienced in the last two years because. I was influenced at one point in my life to like, Dave, check out this book. You've got a long commute. I know you can't read a book, so why don't you try an audio book? And I found the right book that Why launched... couldn't you read a book? I did, uh, just short on time. Okay. Right, so like, it's not an educational thing. It's simply a, a convenience thing. I thought you were gonna say, eh, I'm not much of a reader. I'm more of an auditory learner. Uh, I learn very, very well by a lot of mixed sure. um, video, audio, and text. Yeah, yeah. So that's why that's why our system of the BBR podcast is set up the way that it is. Yeah, yeah. Accompanying blogs with the video, with the audio, so that our learners can so all... Tell me about this us. book you were tapping into. Oh, so um, I, I wanted to grow my business. I was sitting right around the 50-some thousand year mark in year three, mm -hmm. sole proprietor, built up this personal training business to about that revenue. And I wanted to grow and I stumbled upon Grant Cardone 10x rule. I thought I was working pretty hard, but he'll call you out and say, you can multiply it by 10 and still get some sleep at night. So I took some principles from the book and I stumbled upon Bob Sugar's quote of, your business will only grow as much as you do. And if I was incentivized to grow my income and my revenue exponentially, well then I needed to grow exponentially as well. So it went from those books to The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks, which I love, um, understanding what was holding me back and my limiting beliefs. And then it just kind of uh, snowballed from there. Nice. In a really good way. So do you feel like you were betraying yourself unconsciously in some of the old ways? I was so conscious of it that I was aware of the walls I had built up around myself. Mm -hmm. And I was happy and content in that solitude. Mm-hmm. For only a certain period of time, though. Right. And then it kind of blew up on you. Yeah, absolutely. Through a breakup mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. one of the worst kind, mm. you know. Um, so an initiatory journey of a sort. I call it a catalyst event. There like it is an initiator, like a chemical reaction sure, sure. of this instantaneous change in myself. Mm. And I thought to myself, this cannot be it. Mm. And there were other there were other reasons for the breakup other than one finite moment. Mm -hmm. It was built up to that point, but because of that, um, 
I chose to rebuild a relationship with God. So that's within two years. Um, I chose to dive deeper into the Enneagram because it was a tool for me to use. And then, of course, I needed to speak to somebody professional. Mm -hmm. So all these skills I brought together um, to help myself with homework assignments that I gave myself with additional reading. Yeah, yeah. So you kind of did, you know, personal growth training program. It literally was. And yeah. being single that whole time with like one or two, two to three month uh, short term relationships in there were maybe exclusive, um, maybe some blurred lines on the DTR, but it, being single, intentionally single during that time was the best choice I could have made. Yeah, yeah, and that's so important. Yeah, and I'll work with people who are going through divorce and uh, they have to become friends with themselves because they've lost themselves and our cultural model of relationship mm -hmm. is um, it's very much about losing ourselves in the other very unhealthy yeah it's uh it's glorified in our culture that uh you complete me the yeah. jerry Maguire thing or um i would die for you yeah in essence as a protector i would i would die for my children i would rather i would rather take the bullet myself than her physically yeah, yeah. but i'm not going to i would be able to live without the other person is the huge difference. <laughs> and the fact that we even need to put that scenario up as if we're like, I just had an image of you, you know, in a Conan bar barbarian style kind of accoutrements and, you know, actually. Taking a bullet, like, literally. like a Hollywood kind of scenario and that's not life. You know, no, that's it's not. not how things work. And there is a huge distinction um, for your child versus for your spouse. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, uh, but we can go into a tangent sure. about unconditional love, and um, we've never done that on the podcast. Uh, I, I, I give you my sixty seconds sn snapshot of it. We can take we can take sure, as much time sure. on that because I saw it on Facebook yesterday. Somebody asked the question, uh, "What does love mean to you?" Um, and one of the first responses was unconditional and blah 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 blah. Yeah, and of course I resist the urge to like dive into a conversation it's a on. very loaded word unconditional absolutely um my default is that's what a child seeks and that's what a child needs i don't know that an adult needs unconditional love because the truth is if i'm in relationship with you and you're constantly late or you're forgetting things etc etc there are conditions to adult relationships uh, I, you might lose my trust you might lose my love. And that's a superficial example. Sure. Um, there are conditions when it comes to love. Yes, and there's an essence that's trying to be expressed in that phrase, unconditional love, that is really what we're seeking, which is not unconditional. And just, I'm gonna go back, it's sovereign love. Mm -hmm. It's where I see the light in you that brings out the light in me. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're gonna love me regardless of how I act or what I do. That's very immature. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hard thing to adhere to for your whole life. Um, I think it puts an enormous pressure mm -hmm. on a human being, uh, and, and it's a box. Mm -hmm. So it's very until confining until we like have a depth box. of understanding of ourselves. We can't have that depth of understanding in relationship, which means. Often that term unconditional love is it's more like um it's like a facade. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I haven't done my work and gone deep enough in myself to really understand what that really means. But you need to be perfect for me. Right. Yeah. Like I don't even love myself unconditionally, yeah. but you need to. Yeah. You know? I, I that was on my mind. Like that was the exact words that I would I would say. Like we don't even love ourselves unconditionally because we beat ourselves up in our self talk. Yeah. We're saying like I'll do this when I have this, or like, we can always go back to the money issue. Money does not buy happiness, but we always phrase it like, when I have this X amount of money, I'll take this vacation so I can show myself love and appreciation and yeah. respect and, and take that time off so that I don't get burnt out. Yeah. When I hear the word unconditional love, I- Unconditional is kind of a cruel word. <laughs> it's very, very- Loaded. <laughs> oh, lo loaded is like the right way to say that. But I want to come into a conversation about unconditional love with this parameter. Monogamy is a spectrum. It's not just one finite answer. 
And if an unconditional love in a monogamous relationship has these boundaries on it, then it's certainly not unconditional. If a partner wants to bring in a third partner into the situation, and that's their deal breaker, that's their boundary, then it's not unconditional, is it? Mm. And then the other end of the spectrum too is like, well, my partner doesn't want to have sex with me anymore because they're disinterested or they're going through their own thing and, and it's a phase. But I can't stay with somebody who's not going to have sex with me. That's right. also not unconditional. Right. So this f fluid spectrum, I was just finishing Mating in Captivity by Esther Perel. Oh, and it's really a good teaching book. She's very eloquent and she's very simple. I would, I would say to like, anybody, if, if you're interested in this topic and that's come up, uh, read Mating in Captivity as well as Fixing You is Killing Me. <laughs> and I want to come back to that too. Um, I want to say that to somebody who uses unconditional love as like a phrasing. That's uh, like a simplification of what they're looking for. Mm. Cause that's because they haven't done their own work to really know who they are, what their desires, needs, and identity Did are. you write it down? Did you set your intentions? Do you have boundaries? And then boundaries you... are quite healthy for oh, relationships, you know, and agreements and absolutely. And then have you learned how to manage your own expectations too? Unconditional love. So I want to tap into yeah. something. Somebody <laughs> asked me the other day, how do they know if they're fixing their partner? And I just came up with a really concise definition that I think is very unintuitive. I said, when you're deflecting, when you're trying to not feel pain that lives within you, by trying to help them with mm -hmm. what you perceive is going to be hurtful to mm -hmm. them. Did you get all that? Yeah, I did. And so when you're trying to avoid pain within yourself by making somebody else better. That's correct. Yeah. And so I think of fixing is often something we do in this attempt to reach this unconditional love. Uh, yeah. So I'll I'm just tying it back mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And if, if we clear, if we clarify really quickly, because I think that this will help the, that concept that sure. we just finished talking. Why is attempting to fix somebody else unhealthy in a relationship? It disrespects their sovereignty. It disrespects that they're a powerful, autonomous, sovereign being. It disrespects the fact that we only become stronger, bigger, more loving by doing our own work. It's me saying, I'm going to do attempt to do your work for you or at least rearrange a part of our lives so that you don't have to do your work and your life's going to be better and really can we curse on this thing go right ahead <laughs> it's completely fucking arrogant yeah that but i'm it, in such a place it's, that it's, it's back yeah. to this good uh, road to hell paved with good intentions it's complete arrogance to think that you can Fix somebody else. Right. Yeah. Know the best course of action for them. And this goes back mm -hmm. to like falling in love with someone's potential. Not a good idea. Yeah, but definitely not. Fall in love with the person who's in front of you. And the, the person who's a reflection of yourself. So what you're saying, I believe in wholeheartedly, that it starts with me. It always starts with me, but it also ends with me too with the personal responsibility. But I've done all this work on my own, by myself, and so that you could bring it into the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm yeah. not a hurricane, which I've heard before. I'm not a disruptive force. I'm actually going to leave it better than I found it, you know, because yeah. I'm better than what I used to be. Yeah. And that's the journey. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, but, but what did you think of that concept of fixing is often a, a point, a way of deflecting your own pain? Does that resonate? It does. Absolutely. I think that's another isolation tool. Mm. of like actually takes you out of connection with yourself absolutely like, and, and your partner yep too. totally true or maybe um, it's a shadow yeah. connection I'm gonna point so many fingers this direction yeah. and not realize that I need to reflect here and actually look at myself in the mirror and women joke when they see a male author under the title of my book they're like oh I thought that was a female problem you know and it's true though yeah. that, that does often you know I think I think a regular a common pattern is that we take on projects. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's why that... Um, um, Should we wrap up? Yeah, in a few minutes, yeah. Definitely. Oh, good conversation. Um, and that's a... a cons uh, what am I trying to say? We're talking about um, taking on a project. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's a good point because yeah, she she became my project. Yeah, and and so when we take on a project of another human being, it gives us purpose. It gives us meaning. But I'm gonna say, just like the big love, small love concept, uh, it's 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 not a meaning to fix someone or take them on as a project. Is not a purpose or meaning that's coming from empowerment or a sovereign place. A sovereign, yeah. yeah. Thanks yeah. for coming back to Be- that. Because it's absolutely not about you. Yeah. Yeah. And one one uh, have you do you know the uh, um, I'm gonna call it the. I'm just, it's, words are failing me right now, but uh, uh, the drama triangle. Yes. Victim, yes. perpetrator, rescuer. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and so the opposite is assertive, caring, and vulnerable. I don't know if a lot of times people don't hear the flip side. I have never heard it. Yeah. So I'm so, glad you brought it up. So victim, um, uh, we know what that is, one down. Perpetrator, one up. Uh, rescuer. And, and, Connector between the two. Yeah, and, and a lot of times people uh, ping between three sides. Mm-hmm. I perpetrate, then I go in and rescue, and all this is being driven from a, a victim place. Um, yeah, I'm fascinated by it. And then, so let's see if we can tie in so the, the, the perpetrator, and when the perpetrator's in the healthy, uh, they're going to be assertive instead of aggressive. When the rescuer is in the healthy... Uh, they're going to be in the caring. So the difference of caring versus caretaking. And then, uh, so we said, and then the victim uh, is going to be vulnerable instead of throwing themselves under a bus. Mm-hmm. The difference between vul- and we're often not vulnerable because we fear getting run over. You, you kind of see that? Yeah, I do. I do, yeah. It resonates with me a lot as, as a fan of the Enneagram. My lifelong journey is to understand that vulnerability is a strength and not a weakness yeah and 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 the biggest thing i teach with vulnerability is how do we do it um when we're start i I like to say when we're getting our vulnerability chops on and we're really just willing to step into that first we got to make sure it's safe you know we can't parade our vulnerability around no it's got to be a safe container that you trust with your gut and, and, and so much of the work that I do is getting back in touch with your gut, uh, your, an Asian system is called the Dantian, um, that's in, that place of deep knowing, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of times that's not here. And uh, sometimes, yeah, it's, it's often not in the heart too, because the heart, uh, I love this phrase, don't, I don't believe all my emotions. You know, um, I love this Einstein quote, he said, the, the rational mind is a servant. The intuitive mind, which is more the deeper knowing, um, um, is a master. Unfortunately, in our culture, the servant has won out over the master, which means we're in a culture that operates very much from the mind and doesn't, in mainstream culture, is not led by a lot of wisdom. And yet there's pockets of wisdoms happening everywhere. Here, uh, you know, Brene Brown, uh, you know, all this self-help stuff that's out there. And yet at the same time, it's shown time and time again that self-help does not work. Because you can't do it alone. Yeah. That's why we have a community. Of, right. So personal yeah. growth works, but self-help doesn't. Got it. Yeah. So. Well, I think that that's a great place to... Uh, wrap it up because yeah. I know your time is valuable and I want to thank you very much for making the trek down uh, to the studio but if your message resonates what's the best way to get a hold of you check out stuartmatola.com s-t-u-a-r-t-m-o-t-o-l-a dot com um, subscribe to my weekly blog I can say authentically and honestly um, I am one of the best writers writing on this topic right now um, and it would be in alignment with you if you resonated with what I spoke to here. And uh, also on my website is you can contact me for a free half hour consultation. And uh, yeah, checking out my work, stuartmatolo.com. Yeah, and the, book, uh, and the book, Fixing You course. Is Killing Me. Fixing You Is Killing Me. Available on Amazon and your website. Correct. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. My pleasure, Stuart. Thank you very awesome. much.